It's a tremendous privilege to welcome you to my story. We're going to talk to a person today who's well known here in Ireland, who has had an encounter with the living Lord Jesus. My name is Terry Waters and the gentleman concerned is Stuart Elliott, famous for football, uh, a man who seems to have a passion for life, not just football, but something else. But tell us a little bit about your early life, Stuart, and you know, you came from East Belfast. Tell us a bit about your family and your background. Yeah, I grew up in uh, a big, big family, Terry. Um, my, my father and my mother had tailed 10 children. I was number seven in the family and uh, seven sisters, and I had two brothers. Um, so it was quite interesting in my house, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, my mum and dad loved us very much, and uh, my dad uh, was a plumber, heater and renovator. Uh, he worked every hour God sends to, to make ends meet for the family, and my mum was a devoted housewife. Um, and so uh, it, was a, it was a challenge to grow up in such a big family, but it was also great fun as well. Something very special about being in a big family, isn't it? Uh, yeah, well, how you relate to each other. Yeah, well, you, you sort of weigh, um, as we would say in Belfast, rear each other or bring each yeah, other right. up. And uh, that's yeah. the way it was. It was always great fun, um, but there was the downside as well, that if you didn't get to the bathroom in time first thing in the morning, then you were always late for school. <laughs> and if you didn't eat what you had on your plate <laughs> exactly. quickly, it was somebody it was else would eat it. It was like feeding time at the zoo in our house. Yeah, I know. I, I was brought up in a family of six, and that was uh, in interesting enough I'm sure now then tell us you uh, have this passion for football how did that begin and how did, you know tell us a bit about that side of things okay um, well as I said um, I I did have a passion from a very early age I wanted to emulate some of the, the stars um, in the Irish League um, Glen Torham was my team when, when I was growing up um, I wanted to, to to emulate some of those stars that I watched playing in the late eighties and early nineties, and the distant dream for me was to go into the mainland and and emulate people like George Best, Sammy McElroy, Norman Whiteside, and other boys that had left these shores. Um, so my football career started to take off in primary six or seven, I think it was, primary seven. Um, Mr. Mackay, my school teacher, said, Stuart, you're showing great potential, son, and we would like you to represent our primary school at the Greater Belfast Trials. I went along to those trials and basically there was 200 boys or so from uh, the Antrim and Down area. And um, from those boys, uh, it was narrowed down to 15 who could pick them, represent Belfast schools. I made it into the last 15 and at the end of that year, um, after playing on the mainland against some of the English and Scottish schools, I finished uh, with a great award of being... Um, Belfast Schools Player of the Year that particular year and my, my career started to blossom from there because a man called Joe Kincaid who was the chief scout for Rangers Football Club um, he was running the Northern Ireland Champions on the Shankill Road in Belfast called St Andrews and he asked my father if I would come and play for that team and my heart started to beat that bit faster Terry because I knew this was a stepping stone into the professional ranks he was the, as I say, the, uh, the chief scout for Rangers And this was at what, 13? This was, um, yeah, leaving primary school, getting into secondary school, probably the age of 12, just going on 13. So did you continue your education there in St Andrews uh, as well, part uh, of that team? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, a football education, yes. Um, I, I played for them and over the next three years I won the Northern Ireland Championship and went out to a tournament in Holland where all the best boys clubs teams from around Europe were meeting. We won the Holland Cup, which was a fantastic achievement as well. And... Uh, uh, also during those days I was started to um, go over to the Boucher Road in Belfast and join the Manchester United School of Excellence, um, which was a big challenge for me because I'm a Liverpool fan. <laughs> well, I'm sure God will forgive you for that. <laughs> now, something happened at the age of 15 which really rocked you. Mm. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, at the age of 13 um, I lost my dad. Um, one Saturday afternoon, I was on my way home from an amateur league game with a friend of mine called Paul Lehman, who went on to be a captain at Glentorn Football Club. Mm -hmm. uh, and Paul and I were just chatting, as you normal boys do, on the way down back home. And uh, as I got to um, where Paul lived, his auntie came out of the street and told him that he needed to rush on home. And she also pointed me in the direction of my home and uh, said, Stuart, um, you need to, to go home now, son. And I knew by the look on her face that something wasn't quite right. And... Um, that hundred yards from where I met that lady to the, my home was the longest walk of my young life. 
um, because I see my uncle Billy, who was at the end of the street, and as I got closer to him, I could see that he was cut up. There was tears in his eyes, um, and he he broke the news to me that my father, whom was my biggest fan, whom I loved very much, um, he passed away. Um, he took a massive heart attack on the Craigie Road in Belfast, mm -hmm. and I remember going round into my little home terry and seeing the the hopelessness there and the people coming in and consoling my mum and the, the reality that my father had, had gone just would not head home with me as a 13 year old kid. And it was during those days that um, to take my mind off that tragedy um, I continued playing for St Andrews but at the age of 15 um, my football dream collapsed because when other boys were getting apprenticeships to go onto the mainland um, indirectly I was told basically that I was too small and wasn't developed enough and I uh, didn't think at that particular time I was going to go on into the professional ranks and that crushed me because it was the, 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 the last dream that I had really. Well I mean you were obviously shattered with the death of your dad, uh, the disruption that caused to the family and then of course to have the additional disappointment that your footballing dreams appeared to be completely squashed. What was, you must have really been gutted as they say in no. I was, because here I was now at 15, my father's gone, my football dreams collapse, my family situation's not great Terry because no. my mum, although she worked as hard as she could, um, was still struggling to make ends meet and um, my future was uncertain because I left school without any qualifications and it was during those days that my, my life had no direction. I was spent on the street corners every night with my mates and, and asking myself the question, because I was quite a deep thinker. As a kid, I asked myself the question, well, what am I here for and, and what is life really all about? And you actually had no real Christian background. You'd been to Sunday school like every, most young people of your generation. Yeah. Uh, but you had no personal faith or no real experience of God. No, and none of my, father, none of my family really did either. Um, as I say, my Sunday school teachers used to t tell me the stories of Jesus, um, but, you know, as a young kid, how, how could this Jesus who died 2,000 years ago upon a cross be relevant to me today? So it didn't really hit home with me until um, those particular years that I was and, speaking and about. And one, one of your uncles had an experience of Christianity, of Christ. Yeah, my uncle had an amazing conversion. Um, he'd got caught up in the, the troubles in Northern Ireland, um, but it, um, during those days, um, God had gloriously saved him. Um, he'd become born again, and uh, he had a passion to share Christ with, with uh, everybody that he knew, family and friends. So did you see a remarkable difference in your uncle? Massive difference. As I said, he was, he got caught up in loyalist paramilitaries um, and uh, had lived his life, but he would went along to at church one night, um, he'd heard the, the gospel of how Jesus Christ had come to die for his sins and, and that he could be forgiven. Um, and he accepted Christ and, and uh, that was the beginning of a, a new life for him. And he's a real man's man. <clears throat> oh, you better believe it. If you knew this guy, he was as hard as nails. Um, but, you know, even the hardest of men were melted by the love of Christ. And, and, and so you happened. went along with him to uh, the church? Well, basically it, it was a bit of a process because um, the church that he joined, um, they were having a tent mission in my area. And basically in the evenings, it was the gospel being presented in the daytime. It was the young people getting together in the sunny afternoons in August. And uh, my young cousin um, wrapped my door one morning. I was having a lazy morning as teenagers do. And he said to me, Stuart, would you like to come to this youth event that they're having around in the East Belfast playing fields? And I said to him, Glenn, to be honest with you, I don't really want to associate um, with the Christians. What would my mates say if I, they, they thought that I was a Christian? And uh, I said, thanks, but no thanks. And he, Glenn, knowing how to draw me, said that they're, they're giving away free cheeseburgers and cans of Coke. <laughs> and uh, so I went round to the field, not because of any interest in the things of God, but because I wanted a free meal. <laughs> so here's, here's a man who, who comes to hear the gospel yeah. just because of a Coke and a burger. Shows you, as mm. I often say, it, it's amazing how God can draw a person. He drew me through my stomach. So what actually happened? Well, basically, when I arrived at that field, I seen something in those Christian young people that I knew was different. My mates in the street corners did not have it. And I began to inquire as to what it was that they had. And I remember during those days being told that, Stuart, we don't have religion. Religion can put people off. We have a relationship with a living Jesus. This Jesus that you heard about in Sunday school, 
you know, he died upon the cross, but as the scripture says, he rose three days later, and he's alive by the power of his Holy Spirit. He's changed our lives. And if you put your hand in the hand of Christ, then he can take your hopelessness, give you a hope, a future, a reason for living. And they also were faithful, Terry, to tell me about the love of God and a place in his heaven and the judgment of God and a place in that the Bible calls hell. And so having faced these realities at what, about 17 years old or something like this? Yeah, just gone, just after my 17th birthday. Um, what decision did you make then? I mean, did you suddenly uh, have a flashing light and, you know, it was well, as it was if a, God... Well, it was a gradual thing because over the, um, the next three weeks, um, you know, God began to compel me to come to him, you know, as, as one old reformer said, it was irresistible grace. Mm. <laughs> Once I was on the line, I wasn't getting off, you know. And, and as I began to see Christ in these Christians, and as I began to hear the gospel presented, I just was blown away that, that Jesus Christ could be God and he could die for the likes of me. So one evening at church, you were challenged, you felt you had to respond, you made the decision to follow Christ. What changes took place? Because, I mean, here you were still without your football, still mm. grieving, still having to adjust to a different way of life. Tell us a little bit about what happened subsequent. Well, that, that, that night in particular, if I can just go back to it, yeah. was an amazing night because, as I say, God had been dealing with me for three weeks. My uncle had put me in the car to take me over into that particular church. And uh, again, I heard the gospel presented. And uh, sitting in the balcony of that church in Belfast, um, I, I decided, you know, as the guy C.T. Studd, who was a great missionary many years, said, if Jesus Christ is God, and we die for the likes of me, then there's no sacrifice too great that I can make for him. And, and that night I decided, yes, um, irrespective of who's going to follow, uh, I'm going to follow. And I, I decided to give my all for Christ. And the pastor, of course, had looked up into the balcony and looking at me said, there's a lovely young lady up there who wants to become a Christian. Because I had long hair at the time and I was taking sunbeds. I thought it was Roberto Baggio. Um, so it was a humble experience. So it was a real glamour yeah. boy. Eh? But what I've got to say, Terry, is um, I didn't see any angels coming out of the sky that night. No bolts of lightning. But when I left that church, I knew that I was born again and that I was a new creation in Jesus Christ. And I couldn't tell you how because the Spirit, we, the Bible says we cannot tell how the Spirit moves. Yes, but um, something had happened inside me. And in the, probably the few weeks that followed, yeah. um, I just had this overwhelming sense of God's love invading my soul. And, and I fell in love with Jesus Christ. And I'm, that love's still the same today. The amazing thing of this uh, conversion experience, if you call it, or this being born again, or meeting Jesus Christ, I don't know how to explain it either, except that when we invite the Lord to be Lord of our lives, to ask yeah. him to take control of our lives, yeah. somehow you move from a position of knowing about God to suddenly knowing he's your personal Lord yeah. and Saviour. Yeah. Uh, it's. It only God does that. Yeah. People can't do that. Now, you are a Christian. You are at the turning point of life. How did your career and how did life develop from there? Well, um, first of all, I would like to say, Terry, that if uh, anyone was to follow Christ, there's no guarantee that things are going to get better. In fact, they might well get worse. And someone says, well, why follow Christ? Because you have the peace of knowing that... Uh, you're free from the judgment of God and, and you also have a place um, in his heaven and a friend who's going to be with you every step of the way. So uh, as much as things might not get better, I've got to say in my own particular life, things started to get a lot better yeah. and uh, God started to really work through my football career. Right. So how did that develop? Okay, well, um, during those days after my conversion, just after my conversion, um, Glen Torren Football Club um, had invited me to play for their under-17 team and um, I, I accepted the invitation and uh, I ended up going from the fourth team at Glen Torren into the first team um, within a year. I um, made my debut for the first team, scored on my debut and uh, never looked back and went on to finish top scorer 
for Glen Torren, I would say three out of the five seasons that so I was there. So you were in the front line. You were a definitely. I'm you were God, an attacker, were you? Yeah, I was. A, I was a left winger, but I was a left winger who always liked to score goals. To be quite honest with you, because you um, see, some of us uh, are spectators as far as football is concerned. Right, yeah. So you were up there in the front. I was a goal scorer, yes, and uh, I should have been a goal provider, but I like to always get goals as well. Do a well. bit of both. Do a bit of both. I. Yeah. Um, so you become a. Uh, a star at least at Glen Torren and uh, uh, so how many years were you there and uh, and tell us some of the exciting things you did. Well basically um, I made it into the first team as I said um, at a very early age, spent five seasons there, finished top scored three of those seasons um, and it was a very successful time in Glen Torren's history. Roy Coyle who was probably one of the greatest managers in Irish League football, he was my manager at the time and uh, we went on to be a very, very successful young side. Um, I won 10 trophies. Um, I think I'm correct in saying that with Glen Torren. And uh, by the time I'd finished at Glen Torren, I was runner-up to Northern Ireland Footballer of the Year as well, which was a tremendous achievement for a young man. Yes, I'm sure. Now, uh, after the five years at Glen Torren, you went up to, was it Hamilton? Uh, Motherwell. Motherwell. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're just beside each other, yeah, so right, close yeah. enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the um, I got a call from Roy Coyle at the beginning of another season to say that Billy Davis, um, the Motherwell manager in those days, had put a bid of one hundred and twenty thousand pounds in for me, and uh, Glentor needed to take the money, so I needed to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was an exciting time for me, and I remember standing um, on the rocks of Portrush one day before I, you know, launched out to go across the water, and I, I remember praying the prayer and saying, Lord. Um, I've lived completely for you here in Northern Ireland and when I go over onto the mainland I want to, to shine my light over there as well so would you be with me and God really put me to the test the minute I arrived in, in Motherwell. You went there with uh, a young son, uh, what's his name, Nathan? Nathan, yeah. And you're married to Laura. Laura Lee. So Laura Lee, now you uh, go into the, uh, into the dressing room and this First challenge yes. was uh, right in front of you. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I suppose, um, you know, it was no surprise to me because after praying the prayer, God wanted to know, are you going to be faithful That's to right. me here in mm. Scotland the way you were in Northern Ireland? And uh, I, was in, I was in the changing room with some big characters, Terry. Uh, you had Andy Gorham, who's a Rangers in Scotland legend. Robert Martinez, who's now the Everton manager. Um, John Spencer, who played for Chelsea. Lee McCulloch, who's the Rangers captain. Um, I could go on and go on. There were some great uh, boys there, some great players. And uh, just before kickoff, John Spencer um, pulls this Buddha statue out of his bag. And he says, fellas, I've been practicing Buddhism of late and I uh, would like you to rub Buddha's head today for luck. And I went, oh no. And uh, as he's going around all the different players, God the Holy Spirit speaks to me with that, that inner voice and said, I don't want you to do this. And uh, so he came to me and he says, Stuart Elliott, I would like you to rub Buddha's head today for luck. And I says, John, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And he says, well, why ever not? And I says, because I believe what you're holding there is an idol. I serve a living Jesus. And uh, you, know, you got some funny looks, but that was certainly a way of um, introducing yourself as a Christian. And uh, the Bible says them that are willing to honour me and term will honour. Yeah. And I believe God marked that, Terry. And yes. I went on to um, uh, be their top scorer for the next two seasons running and had an opportunity to tell people um, privately and publicly in the papers um, about my faith in Jesus Christ. You were there how many years? Two years. And uh, you were headhunted to go somewhere else? Yes, um, I was uh, I was uh, I was picked to um, go and play for Hull City then. Um, I remember going around the pitch one day of praying as I normally did when Terry Butcher I'm um, a great England player um, mm -hmm. in Italia 90 there and um, played for Rangers as well. He was my manager and uh, he called me in and said that Mo our Hull City had put a bid of two £220,000 for me and uh, again they were administration and uh, they needed the money so I had to go but I was in no panic because I knew it was God's will for me to be in the city of Hull. Yeah. Um, I had been part of uh, a particular church in Belfast. Um, that church had a sister church in Scotland, just where I was playing, and uh, there was another sister church in England, and that was in the city of Hull. Now, if you were a betting man, you wouldn't get odds on that. Um, yeah. That that's surely the hand of God. 
and uh, when you moved to Hull, of course, uh, you had quite a few years there, and not only were you involved in football, but you were involved in, if you like, sharing your faith in a very upfront way, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, most definitely. Tell us a little bit about what <clears throat> happened at Hull. Well, there was the private and then there was the public. I can first of all tell you about the public. Um, I arrived at the club. Uh, Hull is known as the lowest church attended city in Britain. It's the highest in crime rate, um, the lowest in education. It's like Nazareth and Bible set days. Yes. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Yeah. And yet the best came out of Nazareth. Um, and I knew God was going to do something great in Hull, but the first six months um, didn't start off. Well, Jan Mulby, who was a, I was a great fan of the Liverpool team of the 80s, so he was my manager and uh, I, was, I was starstruck by Jan, but things didn't work out well for this man. He ended up getting the sack. And I remember the chairman called me into his office one day and said, Stuart, I've spent this money on the team um, I'm building a new stadium here. Um, can you tell me what's gone wrong? And I said, Mr. Chairman, I do not know, but I believe that God's brought me here for a reason and you're going to see good things in the years that lie ahead. And in those next three years of my contract, we won two promotions in three years. And uh, I finished their top scorer, not just uh, those three years, but five out of the six seasons that I stayed there. Uh, and uh, ended up with the golden boot one of those years as well, 29 goals. Yes, but things were going on in your private life as well. Yeah, as much as uh, God was blessing me publicly, um, I was able to share my faith um, publicly. Um, I joined that church and uh, I become an elder in the church um, and a teaching elder at that. Uh, and the lovely thing was is that as much as people knew me in the football stadium, they also knew where I was ministering as well, and they were able to come and hear the gospel being preached. And uh, some of those supporters were getting born again, they were getting saved, and uh, they went on to be stalwarts in the church and still are to this very day. Um, so that was an amazing thing for me, and, and uh, eventually I went on to become a full-time pastor of that particular church too. Uh, and of course, he, he, Hull was passionate about football, though. They may not have had a, uh, you know, they, they've had a, a, well, a slightly mottled uh, history, haven't they, mm -hmm. as far as being successful and then having difficult times. But yeah. uh, they're passionate about their football, aren't they? Very, very passionate. Um, they were passionate about their rugby as well, oh, but yes. but yeah. um, I think as the football started to, you know, progress through the team started to progress through the leagues, um, the, the crowds were just enormous. Um, I remember one particular Tuesday night when we were in the second division, we had twenty two and a half thousand people, and there was two thousand locked out. So it shows you how passionate they were for the, for their football. There yeah, in I know up that northeast part of England, there it's amazing Definitely. how football is. Very central. So that gave you a wonderful opportunity of witnessing and sharing your faith. Yeah. Most so of them. you were pastor, uh, well, elder, and then became pastor. Yeah. Were you full time pastor, or were you still doing your football as well? Well, I was. I was. Uh, it was a dual sort of role. So I was playing football for the team, and then I was preaching on the Sundays as well. Yeah. Um, and so I was just trying to tie both of those in together. But there came a time when I retired, and um, I went full time into the pastor. So you went back to Hull after you finished your football career. Well, basically, um, when I was um, at Hull, I then signed for Doncaster, which was just up oh, the road. Up the I continued on um, in the church and uh, went to Hamilton for a year. And after being in Hamilton for a year, I got the call to come back to Yorkshire and take on this full-time right. role as pastor, which I did. What, um, uh, when you were sharing your faith, uh, how did you... Uh, you know, what opportunities did you have? I mean, were you having big events or was it more of a personal one-to-one, -one, uh, you know, sharing of your faith? How did you express that sharing of the gospel? Well, you know, I think there's, well, if you talk about, you've got your colleagues for a start in the changing room, um, and I didn't have to always preach the gospel to them. Um, one man used this statement, and I thought it was fantastic. It says, um, preach the gospel and use words if you have to. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, let your life uh, mm -hmm. show um, what you're all about. And I think then daily, I preached the gospel by letting my life show what I was all about. Did you have many Christian colleagues in the football world? I didn't. There wasn't many in the change room, to be quite honest with you. Um, 
I was the only one. But then again, your light shines brighter in the darkness, doesn't it? That's right. Um, so, the, yeah, I was able to share with the players themselves an impact there. I was able to share from public in the stadium. You know, they used to sing, a famous song was, here's to you, Stuart Elliott, Jesus loves you more than you will know. <laughs> <laughs> so the supporters knew all about my stand. Um, and then, obviously, I was invited to go from youth clubs to churches, um, yeah. sporting events. Uh, I, was, I was everywhere really sharing about what Jesus Christ had done in my life. I mean, if we're looking at your life from the outside, those years were great years. Everything seemed to be going wonderful. But you must have had a few uh, periods where life was not as it seemed on the surface, perhaps, yeah. especially with health. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I think about three and a half, four years into my time at Hull City. Um, my health started to deteriorate and my standards weren't um, what they, they were um, in the days gone by. And I wondered what this was all about and because I wasn't able to finish games properly. And I found out that um, uh, I had a condition called bronchial hyperreactivity, exercise induced asthma. And uh, the more I was exercising, the worse it was getting. And so it was a real challenge for me because the supporters didn't really understand why my standards were slipping. And it was a really trying time for me. And it's during those years that I had to um, trust God through the difficult times and not just the good times. There's so much that you have experienced as a Christian, as a footballer. Uh, you're involved now in One Goal Ministries and hoping to put on some big stadium events. Um, just give your website or whatever so that people can have a look at that and uh, be able to see when you're planning these big events. Okay, well, um, yeah, that's what we're hoping to do. Um, take the gospel back to the people, um, reaching people for Christ through sport. And uh, my website is www.one-goal.info. Um, so uh, people can go on and see what we're all about. Stuart, it's been wonderful to be able to share your walk with God, with personally, but also with those that have been listening. One of the things that struck me with Stuart was that he decided at the age of 17 or so when he made his first time commitment that he was going to be upfront as a Christian right from the very beginning. And if you're seeking to follow Christ, he's not looking for secret disciples. Is looking for people who are prepared to be bold and share their faith so that others will know that Jesus Christ is alive. As you're listening, just consider the call of God in your life. God loves you. Thank you for being part of my story today. God bless you.